Hallelujah. So now we're going to the sermon I have uh, entitled my sermon, Jesus Came to Give Us Hope. And uh, let me begin with a story. I think, um, I guess um, we love to see people who are optimistic. Huh? Uh, optimism is in a way quite contagious and encouraging. And so I feel so is hope. And uh, there's this story about a baby mosquito. It's a story, huh? A baby mosquito who came back after its first flight, okay? And so the daddy mosquito asked the baby mosquito, he says, son, how did you feel? The son replied very excitedly. He said, dad, it was wonderful. Everyone was clapping for me. The <laughs> moral of the story is to take everything positively. You can if you want to. Romans 12.12 12 says, Be joyful in hope. Be joyful in hope. And this is where God wants to lead us as Christians and as a church. We must always live a life that reflects the hope in us. And it is not just wishful thinking. It is not just about an attitude, being optimistic. It is actually an assured hope. It is a hope that has foundation. And the foundation, of course, is Christ. Jesus came to give us hope. First Timothy 1 verse 1 says, Christ is our hope. Say me, Christ is our hope. The Lord is our hope. So, the whole thing is that perhaps I want to uh, say here uh, from the front is that if we notice it, the Christian hope is not based on circumstances. The Christian hope, our, our hope, your hope, my hope, is not based on circumstances. Those circumstances can be encouraging at times, but it's not based on people as well, though people can be encouraging at times. It's not based on what we are going through. It's not based on what we feel. It's not based on us. Ultimately, our hope is based on Christ, on who Christ is. And that is the basis of our hope. So in other words, we can be hopeful and we can be continually hopeful. We can be consistently hopeful because of our hope in Christ who never changes because we have decided to put our hope in someone and his character in someone whose character never changes and this is where we are going today i want to bring up at least three characteristics of christ it's about who he is that gives us hope for tomorrow it's about who jesus is that gives us hope for tomorrow. It's not about uh, who the next government is going to be. Though we pray that God will bless this nation with a better government. But my hope is rested on the fact on who Jesus is, not on what is happening around me. And it's on this source of hope, this foundation of hope, that my joy lies on. And so it's very important, Christians, my brothers and sisters. This is the key, I feel, how we can be consistently hopeful in every situation because we place it on the unchanging Son of God. Charles Swindle says this, a Christian pastor, uh, writer, he says you can have it all, you. You can have it all, everything on the wire called Jesus Christ. That wire will never snap. Say me, never snap. It never snap. Not for a lifetime, not for eternity. It's always there, it's always connected, it's always stable. It's not like that walkway in KL that collapsed recently and lives was lost. Everything in this world is fragile. It can collapse, but on Christ, 
It's a wire that never snaps. We all need hope in life. Everything on the wire called Jesus Christ. And that is our hope. And hope motivates us to keep going and not give up. Without hope, we will probably not even want to do anything. Without hope, why would you want to be in this service today? Without hope, why would I work hard on preparing a sermon? Without hope, why would Jean prepare songs? Why? Because we have hope in us that in all that we do, especially I'm talking in the context of serving in the church, it's the hope that all that we do, that God will use it to encourage you, to bless you in the service. And I, I believe you come, you also have the hope that when you come after the service, you live feeling better. You don't wish to come and then you imagine you are going to a service every week and you're not getting anything. And I'm sure time will come, you will drag your feet to church. So you have hope and that is why you are doing what you are doing. Some of you are parents, you are working very hard for your children, studies. Why? Because you have the hope in you that they will do well in studies uh, and they will have a great future one day. So hope is so important. Remember reading this uh, story about a peanut uh, cartoon, Lucy and Linus, and uh, there was this time they were sitting in front of the television. And halfway through the program, Lucy, as usual, being the more dominant character, he was told Linus, he says, Linus, go get me a glass of water. Linus looked surprised. He says, why should I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. Then Lucy thought for a while. He said, okay, on your 75th birthday, I will bake you a cake. Then Linus said, Hmm, okay, so he woke up, he walked to the kitchen and then he turned around, he says, life is more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. <laughs> so the point I'm saying here today, as a Christian, do you have something to look forward to? I pray, I believe, many of you will say yes. But if you don't, I pray, after the sermon today, you will be assured in your heart and you know that you have something to look forward to. You may not even know what you are looking forward to and that's fine, but you know you have something good to look forward to and the basis is not about what you are looking forward to. The point is about who you are placing your hope in that will assure you that your future is fine and secure because of who Jesus is. It's about coming back to the character of Christ. John Maxwell says this, Hope shines brighter when, brightest when the hour is darkest. Hope motivates when discouragement comes. Hope energizes when the body is tired. Hope sweetens when bitterness bites. Hope sings when all melodies are gone. And I remember uh, vaguely a message by a pastor in Singapore who was suffering from terminal cancer. And I think if I got it right, I can't remember the exact words of the title of her sermon. But the last, the last sermon she preached in her church... Um, before she went home to the Lord. Um, I'm not sure it's the title or it was the thesis of that preaching, but it came across in this way. It says, we can dance as Christians. We can dance even when the music has stopped. We can dance even when the music has stopped. So there are some of us here today, you feel that the music has actually stopped for you. Today, the good news is that in Christ, you still have hope. As what the video says, in all things, God works for the good for those who love Him. God wastes 
nothing. Not even when the music has stopped. God wastes nothing. He's at work in your life. That is the power of hope. But what is the basis of our hope as Christians? Today, as the church begins to pray, uh, to, to prepare for the various evangelistic programs for the Christmas season, uh, I want us to be reminded of the message of hope, among other message of Christ that Christ conveys is the message of hope. And I want to us to turn our attention to Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to 17. Of course, there are many narratives in the Bible that can convey to us the character of Christ that assures us of hope in Him. Let's just take Luke chapter 7, 11, 17. Um, the NASB uh, version says this, Soon afterwards, Christ, He went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, a big group of people, imagine uh, excited people following the rabbi, the son of God, this very wise teacher, and uh, in a way, a miracle worker. There were excitement there. They were following this man, this man that is giving them a lot of hope, and you were accompanied by this large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, Another group of people were coming along. And it's a funeral uh, uh, procession, so to speak. A dead man was being carried out. And the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. She not only lost a son, now uh, lost a husband, now she lost a son. And a sizable crowd from the city was within her. So there was this two big groups of people coming. One we can imagine would be quite passionate quite happy, quite excited, uh, uh, hopeful, so to speak. But then the other group is crying in mourning. Uh, uh, Despair is there. There's this feel of pain in this group. And they came together. And what happens next is where we see the character of God as expressed in the life, manifest in the life of Jesus Christ. Let's see how Jesus responded The Bible says when he came, this group came led by the Lord. He saw her, the Bible says, the Lord felt compassion. Say me, compassion. The Lord felt compassion. The Lord didn't feel that, hey, this is a big day. Why are you all doing this? This is not a time for funeral. He felt compassion for her. He was probably being very busy. He was probably on the way to do something. He was probably going for another preaching engagement. But yet this group came, he stopped and he felt compassion for her. Another version says his heart, his heart broke. His heart broke for this woman. His heart broke. I don't know how he impacted the rest of the team. But Jesus Christ the Son of God, the busy Son of God, the Son of God who, are des- who is destined to do great things, and we would have excused Him. He had not taken that time to stop and to look at the woman and had compassion of her. We would have given Him that leeway and say He's too busy. But no, He stopped and He felt compassion. His heart broke when He saw what was happening and said, and not only he felt compassion, he said to her, do not weep. He intervened. He says, do not weep. And he came up, he touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said to the dead man, he says, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man, next we see, He sat up and he became alive and he began to speak. And Jesus took him, gave him back to his mother and the response from the crowd was that fear gripped them all, reverent fear. And they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. This report concerning him went 
out all over Judea and in all the surrounding district. Fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God. The response of Christ give us an idea on where our basis of hope should rest on. First, I want to say a statement I want to make is that hope is assured because Christ is compassionate. When the Lord saw her, He felt compassion for her. His heart went out to her, if you are taking the NIV version. Hope is assured because Christ is compassionate. Today, you and I, we can be assured, we can be assured of our hope, we can be assured that we have a better tomorrow, we can be assured that all things will work out for good simply because Christ is compassionate. Simply because He is compassionate. The thing is that sometimes in our despair, we are prone to think, and I think it's fair for some of us because of life's experiences, that nobody really understands or nobody really cares. Our loneliness actually intensifies that despair. But to know that someone else feels with us, bring us a ray of hope. We are not alone. And today, the good news is that you are not alone even if you feel lonely because Christ is compassionate. Because Christ is compassionate. Today, I have confidence to challenge you to continue to live hopeful lives not because I know what the future exactly holds for you, but because I know who you have put your faith in, because I know who you are worshipping, because I know whom you have declared your faith in, and that is Jesus Christ. And it's not just Jesus Christ a name, He is Jesus Christ the compassionate Saviour, your compassionate God. Today, you have hope in your situation because God will view your situation with compassion. Today, you have hope in your situation because you know that there is a God who cares enough to look at you with feelings, with great compassion and care and love. Today, you have hope not because not because you are worshipping a God who just do the big things but doesn't care about what you are going through. Today, the scripture tells us clearly, reveals very clearly the Son of God who is the manifestation of the invincible God. Just as Jesus is compassionate, God is compassionate. And God is not just compassionate to the church overall. God is compassionate individually to every one of us, just as he was to that widow. There were crowds of people. There were crowds of people following him. Just like there is a crowd here right now. But I, being human, I may not be able to be compassionate to every one of you what you are going through. But today, the good news is that Jesus will zero in on you, whoever is going through a hard time, if you are here today going through a hard time, one thing you can be assured of, God is compassionate to your situation. Can you hear amen from God's people? Amen. amen. Hope is assured because Christ is compassionate. Sometimes we just have this idea that God doesn't really know. Sometimes we have this in us, that there are things that we can hide from God. Maybe we don't intentionally think that way. 
But our actions sometimes may be that way. I remember reading the story. Again, it's a story, just a story of a man who came home drunk. And uh, he was in his bedroom. Wife was helping him uh, to put him back into bed. And then the wife, being a Christian, she knelt down and, uh, and asked the husband, he says, uh, Dear, do you want me to pray for you? The drunkard man, he says, Yes. And she began to pray. She says these prayers. She says, Dear Lord, I pray for my husband who is lying down here drunk. Then immediately the husband interrupt her. He says, please don't tell God I'm drunk. Just tell him I'm sick. <laughs> so I guess he thinks that he can hide things from God. But we can't. We cannot hide things from God. But it's not just about the so-called negative side that we cannot hide the bad things that we do today. Just as we say God is all-knowing, He's not just all-knowing about our life's behavior. He's all-knowing about our life situations as well. Your situation, my situation, and even not just the good times, but even the challenging times, God knows. God knows. He is paying attention to that. Hope is assured because Christ is compassionate and is a compassion that continues that so-called scripture describe it as a compassion that never fails lamentations jeremiah wrote these words because of the lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fails a context of this scripture was Judah was going through a so-called disciplinary period by the Lord. But yet, there was this assurance from the prophet to the people. He says, because of the Lord's great love for Judah, we will not be consumed for his compassions never fail. The word for great love is in Hebrew is hesed which is the idea of loyal love. Because of the Lord's faithful love, loyal love, we will not be consumed. And it's in the context of the faithlessness of Judah that this word came. In other words, in other words, even when we are faithless, God is faithful. Even when we are faithless, God is faithful. And that is where we anchor our hope on. We don't anchor our hope on our faithfulness to God. Because scripture says, even our righteousness are like filthy rags unto the Lord. We will not reach that standard neither were we able as mere human beings be able to continually live a faithful life unto the Lord. I'm not preaching for faithless living here. Please don't misinterpret what I say. I'm saying that there are moments, no matter how faithful we want to be, we can be faithless. But yet at that moment, God's faithful love is still there for you and for me. And that is where we anchor our hope. I am hopeful that God will be compassionate in whatever that I'm going through based not on my character but on God's character because my character will fail the demands that I think I should uh, 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 give. But for God, His faithful love. He is Faithful. So what am I saying here? I'm saying here to you, brothers and sisters, whatever that you are going through, it has nothing about your goodness or your faithfulness. You are assured 
of God's compassion because of His character. Because He is a God who loves you faithfully. He is a God who loves you with a loyal kind of love. It's about loyalty for Him towards you. God is loyal to us. That is the basis of our hope. Again, I'm not saying that you are faithless people. I'm just saying that maybe there are some of us here, you think because I'm not a good enough Christian, so what right do I have to have hope in Christ? Today, I want to tell you that is a lie if you think that way. You have the right. As long as you have faith in Christ, you love the Lord, you have the right to have hope in Christ in your situation because Christ is compassionate, because it's not about your goodness, it's not about your perfection, it is about the character of Christ, that God is compassionate. Can you hear amen from God's people? May you be blessed, may you hold on this truth forever your life and not allow the sense of condemnation to pull you away from the blessings of God that He wants to put in your life, from the blessings of hope that He wants to put in your life. God wants His people, all of you here today, to rejoice in hope. No matter what your situation, no matter what you are going through, perhaps we rejoice with you because good things are happening in your life. Praise the Lord. But even if you are having a hard time today, we we'll want you to rejoice in hope in Christ because God is compassionate to your situation. Hope is assured because Christ is gracious. I love what this man says. He says, our ground of hope is that God does not grow weary of mankind. He does not grow tired of us. I was sharing last night to uh, the Saturday congregation. Some of us are parents here. You know what I mean when I say sometimes we will say words like, you know, being tired of our kids. Uh. When are they growing up? Uh? How long more we have to wake them up? If the alarm can be ringing and ringing, the whole house wake up, the person still not yet wake up. My son still not yet wake up. And then we have to wake them up. Brother Theo laughed very loud. <laughs> Sometimes, yes, we love our children, but sometimes they really tire us out. Do you remember John when he was younger? Uh, I will use this as an example. So the youths always have a lot of bullets for him. And uh, when he was young, I still remember, me and my wife will be flat out in the bedroom. Lights is still on, he's still playing. Both of us decided that we are not going to stay awake for him because we are too tired. And so, we just let him play. And then 2, 3 a.m., we wake up, he's already lying and sleeping. Then only we switch off the light and then bring him to the bed. You know? We get tired. Like, my point is we get tired. But the good news is, God don't get tired. You can play all you want, God will still be awake with you. <laughs> he, long-suffering, he's a patient God. You know, sometimes, we... We, we are experiences where people drive us up, of, up the wall. And we come to a point, oh, I'm so tired of this. When will this person change? When will this person learn? Today, God does not weary of mankind. God does not get tired of loving us because He is a loyal God. He's a faithful God. And we have hope because of that. Hope is assured because Christ is compassionate. The second thing, second basis that we can rest our hope on is that hope is assured for you and me because Christ is gracious. Why I say He's gracious let us just compare the situation that uh, he affected this um, uh, healing or so-called restoration of life 
on this young man. If we look at Luke chapter 7, the first few verses, you go home, you can read about it. It was about the healing of the centurion servant. Now, that was, a, in a way, a totally different context. Different in the sense that, in a sense, the healing of the servant is not in what we understand as really a gracious act of God, so to speak. Why I say that? Because the people, the elders who came to Jesus, who asked for that healing for the centurion servant, they pleaded with Jesus on the basis of the goodness of the centurion. They told Jesus, he says, this man, this centurion, he deserves, say me, deserves. Yes. Now, deserve, that means not grace. You know what grace means? Grace means undeserved favor. Say me, undeserved favor. But for the centurion, it was not undeserved favor. At least for the people who are bringing them to Christ, they feel that he has the right to be granted his wish. It's not grace, it's right. And so, in a way, they were telling Christ, he says, this centurion deserves to have you heal his servant. Because, why? Because he loves our nation, he loves the Jews, and has built our synagogue. So the basis, of course, the healing took place, but the basis for that healing was not totally grace, because it's about being deserved, being of that healing. But for the woman, it was a totally new context. The scripture says that he was just only a mother, she was a widow, and that's all. That's all. A mother and a widow. She was not someone who had done something for the nation of Israel. She was not someone who had probably built a synagogue for the Jews. She does not deserve this intervention of Christ at all. But yet, we see Christ out of His compassion and grace, He intervened into this widow situation. He didn't say, oh, I just healed a servant of the centurion. At least that guy did something for Israel, built the synagogues for the Jew. Oh, yeah, this woman, I think she didn't do much, right? Just a normal, normal person. You know? I, I, I think, oh, yeah, let her be, lah, you know? But no, in God's eyes, it's not about who you are. Again, it's not about who you are. It's not about your position. It's not about our achievement when we talk about grace. It's not what we have done. It's not because I'm a pastor, so he preaches, he serves full time. So more grace given to him, so he will have the grace of God. Because he deserves, if I am being blessed by God because of what I do, I'm not experiencing the grace of God. It's because I'm blessed by God, even I didn't do what I'm supposed to do, then that is grace. Undeserved favor. Brothers and sisters in Christ, may we all hold on to this. Hope is assured because Christ is gracious. What is grace? Illustrated it in this way. When a person works for an eight-hour day and receives a fair pay, day's pay for his time, that is a wage, that is a salary. That is one you deserve. You work eight hours, you are paid eight hours, that's what you deserve. When a person wins a competition, receives a trophy for his performance, that is a prize. Oh, Tzu Yang won a prize for futsal. Took a cup, put on the WhatsApp. Wow. That's a prize. But that prize came from hard work. He deserves it because he plays every Wednesday futsal. Huh? And then some, huh? Monday, now Monday. So you want to play, also can play him. Okay? So, eh. He, he, he gung ho about it. He, he's doing it. And so he deserves. I mean, he worked so hard. He played so hard. He should win now. Ah. Okay, praise the Lord. We clap. 
When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievement, that is an award. Maybe in our 30th anniversary, we'll give the longest member award to Brother Theo. Because he was in this church from beginning until now. Hallelujah. And we are glad. That is an award. He deserves it because he has proved his faithfulness. He has done something. But that is not grace. What is grace? Grace is when a person is not even capable of earning a wage, a salary. And he can win no prize, perhaps because he doesn't even uh, have the ability to train. And he deserves no award for any reason. But yet he receives such a gift anyway. Well, that is a good picture of God's grace. This is grace, undeserved favor. Undeserved favor. An atheist once challenged a man, he said, if there is a God, may he prove himself by striking me dead right now with thunder and lightning. Of course, nothing happened. Then he proudly said, you see, there is no God. A Christian responded, you only prove that he is a gracious God. The one quality that makes grace grace is that it's always given to people who do not deserve it. Romans 5, 8 says, But God put His love on the line for us, the paraphrased version, by offering His Son in sacrificial death while we were of no use, whatever, to Him. And that is grace. So what is this grace? Why is this grace so important? Why we need this grace in our life? Perhaps 1 Peter 5.10 gives us an idea. Peter wrote, after you have suffered a little while to the church during that time, going through a lot of persecution, he says, the God of all grace, say me, God of all grace. The God of all grace whom we are worshipping today, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish and ground you securely and strengthen and settle you, all in the context of the gracious God. So when we talk about grace, we talk a few aspects of grace. We talk about the saving grace of God. He called you to his eternal glory. We do not earn this salvation. It's simply the grace of God. It's not because we are good enough to go to heaven. It's not because you have done something good. It's your merit. That's why you are going to heaven. No. It is by faith, in grace, by grace alone. Grace is not a reward for the righteous. It is a gift for the guilty. May I even replace it as salvation. It's not a reward for the righteous, but it is a gift for the guilty when they choose to exercise faith in Christ. So when we talk about grace for Christians, we believe about saving grace. We also talk about sufficient grace. The complete, the word says, God's grace is as sufficient as the water of the oceans to its inhabitants. Paul says uh, he had this struggle with the thorn. And this is what God said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you. Say me sufficient. So whatever that you are going through, your hope rests in the fact that grace from God will be sufficient, will be enough. You will not run out. I was uh, illustrating this point yesterday. I used the, the idea of uh, data that we use for our, for our handphone, right? Some of you sign up certain uh, uh, plans and you only have 5 gig. So sad. One night watch FB, finish already. Second day, uh, Pastor, can uh, go on hotspot or not? My phone, no more data already. 
Well, you thank God. Thank God you signed into God's program, God's plan. This data plan, unlimited. Say with me, unlimited. unlimited. It's sufficient, you know, unlimited one. It's always enough. You won't run out of grace from God, whatever that you are going through. Grace is also sanctifying. It makes you what you ought to be. How liberating that truth is. Isn't it not? To know that it is the grace of God at work in our life that will help us to be who God wants us to be. Yes, we need to choose to cooperate. Yes, we need to choose to respond positively. But yet, it is actually the work of God in our lives that stirs us to do what we want to do, that gives us that desire to be passionate, to be committed. It is grace that is at work in your life that nudge you even to church today. It is grace in your life that will nudge you to say, I will serve the Lord. It's grace that is in your life that will nudge you to say, no, this is what you are not supposed to do, and so you obey. It is the grace of God, the continuing, sanctifying grace of God that make you today, compared to five years ago, compared to ten years ago, a better person. Because it's the continuing work of grace. Grace not only saves us from sin, grace turns us from sin. Before you were a Christian, doing anything wrong, no problem. It is the in thing to do. It is what we men do, or what we women do, or what we girls do, or boys do. We just say, if everyone is doing it, then it's right. But now you are a Christian. There's this conscience pricking you. It is the sanctifying grace of God at work in your life. Grace is also about surviving grace, not in a negative sense like you're dying, they're just only surviving, but in the sense that it is long term, it is about establishment, it is about grounding you securely. It is about the eternal grace. It is about the enduring grace. It is about the long term, the long haul. The grace of God is here for you for the long haul. It won't stop halfway. It won't say it's like, oh, now you are middle age, no more grace for you, less grace. Only 20 years old to 40 years old, a lot of grace. Then 40 to 50, less grace. 50 to 60, luggy less. No, it's eternal, it's enduring, it's surviving, it's always there, it never gives up. And of course, it's also strengthening grace. Strengthening and settling you, the grace of God. Grace is not given because we have done good works. Grace is given in order, say me, in order. In order, so that you and I, we can do that good work. So this is grace. This is what grace is all about. And it is on this that we put our hope in. I am hopeful. I am hopeful in my situation because of the grace of God. I am hopeful. I am confident in my salvation because of the saving grace of God in my life. And I am not fearful about my challenges in future or present or future because of the sufficient grace of God in my life. I did not need to be afraid that one day I wake up and God tells me, you have finished your data. No renewal for you anymore. Full stop. Michael Yo, Chukuk. No more. No, this will never happen. For me or for you? I am hopeful in my Christian life because I know God is still at work in my life. The sanctifying grace of God because the grace of God is changing me, transforming me. And I know I am hopeful and I am confident 
my the the future Michael Yo will be better than the Michael Yo today. And it applies to you as well. Because grace is sanctifying you day by day. I am confident because grace will establish, ground me securely. I'm confident grace will strengthen me. I'm not afraid of new challenges because I know if ever another day of weariness come, if another day of so-called tiredness come, I can depend on that day, at that moment, on the grace of God to sustain me, to strengthen me, to strengthen my weakness. I am confident. And so I'm not afraid of future challenges. I do not see that, oh, I'm running out of steam. I have served 20 years. Now my energy all gone, all given up. Well, it's not my energy that I'm serving. The last 20 years I was serving in the grace of God. The energy came from the grace of God. And so the grace of God will sustain me as long as the Lord wants me to serve Him. And so why should I worry? It wasn't me in the first place. Say me, it wasn't me. It wasn't us in the first place that we can come this far. Do you know that? It is the strengthening grace of God in your life. So why need to be afraid of future challenges? Come back. Come back to the grace of God. And so, my hope is assured because Christ is gracious. Compassionate, gracious. But then the question is this, what good is compassion? What good is grace without capability? And that comes to our third point. Okay, this is the abounding. Hope is assured because Christ is powerful. Say me, powerful. powerful. I mean, we read the narration. The narrative, it says, is, young man, I say to you, arise. Dead man sat up, began to speak. And that's the power of God. The dead became alive. The blind can see, the deaf can hear, the sick gets healed. That's the power of Christ and so the power of God. And consider the impact that he had on the people. He was powerful in the sense on the man himself. He's a dead man. He experienced the power of God in his life because now he's alive again. He has the powerful effect on the mother because the mother now obviously from a very hopeless, sad, despairing woman, now hope is restored. His son is alive again. He doesn't need to cry anymore. So the emotional impact on her would have been tremendous. There were also powerful effects on the observers. Bible says reverent fear gripped their hearts. They were powerful effects on those who have heard because the report, the reports, they were not there to see, but just hearing the report that there's this man, Jesus Christ, rose up the day. And so they were talking about it. They were talking about it all over the surrounding district, the Bible says. So there was such a powerful impact on many people. There is power when Jesus is in our situation. And so this is the basis, another basis for your hope and my hope. We not only serve, worship, and being loved by a gracious God, by a compassionate God, but by one who is powerful enough to intervene into your situation in accordance to His grace, love, and sovereign will, He can turn your situation around and make it work, whatever that may be. And that is our hope. 
Do you know Christ has the authority to heal you? Do you know Christ has the power to turn your situation around? And maybe, perhaps this may be the missing link in our journey of faith that hinders us from living a joyful life. Because for some of us, yes, pastor, I agree with you. God loves me. God cares for me. God is gracious. But I'm not very sure whether He can really turn my situation around. Today, as we come to the conclusion of my sermon, this is what I want to challenge you. To believe God for a miracle in your life. Say me, miracle. miracle. But you believe that our God is a miracle-working God. Then can I ask you what is stopping you from asking God for a miracle for yourself? Let me ask you that. Think about that. What is stopping you? What is stopping you? What is stopping us? What is stopping us if we really believe what we say we believe? I pray today as we conclude in a little while, I want to give an opportunity to you to pray to God for us for a miracle. Something that you really wish to see happening in your life and trust God for it. Your God is a powerful God. I want to close now with one final uh, video. One final video. Uh, it's a story of a young man in Haiti. I think it's, it's an encouraging uh, testimony. And just want you to watch it. Then we are close. If you read in the Bible the story of Joseph and David, you will find me there. My story is their story. My name is John Mark. I'm 17 years old. This is the village where I grew up in Haiti. Most of the people here are poor. There aren't many opportunities for the uneducated. My mom was very gentle and generous. Her dream was for me to get an education, to not have the same life that she had. But going to school cost money. She would go around with guys, doing bad things with them to get money, so I can eat. One day, she stole something from someone. The people tied her to a post and beat her. I cried for them to stop, but they just laugh at me. All of these things happening because of me, so that I might have a better life. A few months later, my mom got very sick, and on Christmas Eve in 2006, she died in a hospital. I didn't even find out until six days later. After her death, I was alone. I was 10 years old. I was so hungry, and I was like, Lord, I know you fit 5,000 people. I am only one person, why can't I get fit? And then, God provided. I've been at Mission of Hope for eight years now. When I first woke up here, I thought I was dreaming. 
you were sleeping in the mud. Now you get bed, you have shower, food. I couldn't believe it. Totally couldn't believe it. Now you and the family. I never thought I would have an education, but God is giving me one here. It's paid for by people I don't know. They sponsor me to go to school. I like math and physics the best. If I wasn't in school, I would not have a future. I'm learning so much that I want to share with others too. So I tutor. So I tutor. If somebody comes to me and tells me he is hopeless, I will understand because I've been through it. If I don't take what God has given me and use it to help others, who will? If my mom were here, I think she would cry and be proud to know that all her dreams are coming true for me. I like the story in the Bible of Joseph and David. Both of these men had great difficulties, just like I did. But God was with them always. Maybe the bad things in your life happen so that you can become strong. It is from the struggles that we grow. Amen. Amen. Maybe there are things in our life that sometimes God allows so that we can be strong. Maybe some of us here today, you feel that you are in a challenging situation. You may even think that why this has to happen to you. But like what Jane Mark says, sometimes things happen in our life so that you can be strong. It's through our struggles that we grow. It is through such seasons of life that we learn to realize that our hope should be in Christ and not in the things that are happening around us, not in the people, not in the circumstances. Sometimes that could be just the only lesson that God continuously wants to teach us that our dependency, that our sufficiency must always be on Christ and Christ alone. Our hope, our source of joy must always be based not on circumstances which changes every time, which are not certain all the time, but on the unchanging Son of God who is gracious, compassionate, powerful, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Christ who raised the dead man from the dead to life. The same Christ is here today with us. The same Christ who turned the situation around for Joseph, for David, for Jean Mark, is the same God that wants to come into our life to turn the situations in our life around for the better, for His glory. Amen? Would you stand even as we close, as I invite the team to come, worship team, we're going to close in prayer. Hallelujah.